All right, welcome everyone. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us today uh, or tonight or, to, or this morning, depending on where you are. I know Armani, <laughs> it's, it's a lot later where Armani is than where we are. Um, my name is Harrison Kinane Smith and I'm the editor of the Bunker Project's handoff series in, in Pittsburgh. And before I introduce Armani, I just wanna give you guys a quick um, summary of Bunker Projects and um, a few other things I'd like to mention. So Bunker Projects is a Pittsburgh-based artist residency and experimental gallery specializing in contemporary and multidisciplinary art making. Today's programming is part of our online reviews handoff series, which it is designed to provide emerging Black visual artists with the opportunity to think and write critically about key topics around their creative practice. Um, now, the first two things I'd like to mention are Bunker is right now in the midst of our end of year giving drive, and we need your help. Your support will allow us to expand our residency program, continue to pay artists and contributors to create exciting exhibitions for the coming year. Please consider becoming a one-time or sustaining donor. The first $5,000 will be generously matched by our partners at a &E. Your generous gift will make a big impact on the vibrant Pittsburgh arts community and help continue funding programs like this. And secondly, we're very grateful to announce that the handoff project was recently awarded funding through the Advancing Black Arts in Pittsburgh program, which is led by the Pittsburgh Foundation and the Heinz Endowments. So we're grateful for that support, but of course we need more to do all of the amazing things that Bunker Projects as an organization does. So uh, please consider donating. Um, and now finally, we're very excited today to present Armani Fuentes, a Pittsburgh-based artist, writer, and member of the artist collective Hotbed. Armani is also the handoff's most recent contributor, having recently published their essay, Tablias in the Puerto Rican Interior. I'll send a link to that in the chat in case any of you want to have it um, around to reference right now. Now, uh, the structure of this, uh, this event will be pretty casual. We'll have a 45 minute presentation or discussion um, with Armani talking about their work. And then we'll follow that with a 15 to 25 minute Q&A um, with questions for myself and also you in the audience if you if you have any. And if you'd like, when we get there, you can either raise your hand using the Zoom functions or um, you can just note your question or that you'd like to ask a question in the um, chat. And I'll either invite you to unmute yourself or um, I can ask your question for you. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Armani. Hi everyone, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so I can just get the presentation up there. Okay, can everyone like see and hear me okay? Okay, cool. Um, well, thank you all for coming. I know that um, it's an awkward time and we're kind of spread across the world, some of us, but um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Um, and thank you all for joining. Um, and thanks to Harrison for being really a wonderful editor for this project, but also for moderating the talk. Um, because there's not too many of us here, um, we can keep it pretty casual. If you really have any pressing questions or thoughts, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and I can incorporate maybe answering that into the actual presentation. Um, I'll be presenting on an essay that I wrote for Bunker Projects through their handoff series. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the project here, just kind of sketch out what we're going to be seeing and talking about. Um, in its written form, this essay really grew out of the work I did through the Guggenheim Summer College Workshop in 2021, uh, which I know um, Harrison participated in the previous year. Um, but I think as an intellectual and artistic inquiry, it's a much older project. Um, at one point, this was going to be like my senior art history thesis in undergrad before I decided to focus more on my emerging visual practice. Um, but even before that, this is like a pretty personal project, and I guess I'll talk more about um, about that when I talk about growing up in Massachusetts and how that relates to um, to the work. And yeah, it's largely an art historical presentation um, with a kind of like artist talk segment at the end um, and some Q and A stuff. Uh, yeah, so I'll begin with the art history stuff, and then I'll kind of end with the ways in which I engage and expand on uh, some of the ideas through my own work. Um, so without further ado. Okay, so we'll start here. Um, this is a picture that I, I took on my iPhone at my cousin's house like a few weeks back. Um, and as you can see, it's just like a counter in her kitchen and it's full of like these little souvenirs that um, she decorates her, her kitchen with her house with. They're all kind of like objects from Puerto Rico 
little hats, little cups, little like mugs, little like nips of, of alcohol, of Puerto Rican rum. Um, and these as well, this is like from the other side of our kitchen. It's just like chock full of knickknacks and little souvenirs. Um, and I guess like, I guess I'll begin with this word that I am trying to like define and think through um, this word polqueria which is a Spanish term that kind of loosely translates to like junk or trash or something that isn't like valuable. Um, it has a kind of negative connotation, um, but it's a word I heard a lot growing up. Um, my mom would kind of say it when I would eat too much junk food, like that I was coming to polqueria or like if something was just like not worth her time, she would say it's polqueria. Um, but I kind of want to reframe that word um, in the context of like domestic decoration and, and kitsch. Um, I think knickknacks, tchotchkes, trinkets, baubles, um, just kind of stuff, things that are inexpensive and mass produced, have a pretty capacious power to transform and resignify a domestic space, um, what I'm calling the Puerto Rican interior. Um, and I think Polqueria as a decorative program um, that diasporic Puerto Ricans use to make domestic spaces in the US kind of feel more like, like you know, like an apartment or a car. Um, it's it's interesting that these places are kind of these objects are kind of used to like Puerto Ricanize space or to kind of make places feel more at home or more comfortable, warmer. Um, and I think my redefinition, um, and this is something that the essay doesn't touch on, um, but I kind of uh, the presentation I think expands on some of the ideas that I only hint at in the essay. But um, this word porqueria actually I think um, in my definition of it owes a lot to. Um, the work of New York City artist Pepe Osorio, who's a Puerto Rican artist who's still active, but who was really, really active in the 80s and 90s. Um, and he kind of uh, used the term chucherias, which is a kind of cognate term to polqueria, very similar interrelated term. Um, and in his kind of installations, they're really replete with like, with stuff, with like little objects. I mean, in, in the photo on the right of his um, installation, Badge of Honor, I mean, it's like your eye doesn't really know where to rest because it's like so full of things and it's full of like things that are supposed to evoke this feeling of like Puerto Rican identity. And in this particular piece, it's really about manhood. But, um, you know, I think that the this is a kind of a perfect setting to start because other artists have been kind of thinking through this idea of like tchotchkes and mass produced objects as like a kind of um, as a homemaking device and as a kind of important aspect of like identity formation. Um, actually, one of his um, one of the essays that are that uh, I read that's a kind of about his work uh, coined the term like New Yorkian Baroque, and that's always kind of really stuck with me. Just thinking about um, a Baroque decorative sensibility around these mass-produced objects, um, thinking about like the tchotchkes in like a grandma's house or like all the stuff I showed you in my in my cousin's house earlier. Um, so yeah, the these two kind of terms are interrelated, but I, I chucherias is not something that I heard a lot growing up. Um, so I I prefer polqueria because it feels really closer to home for me. Um, and yeah, it kind of reemphasizes polqueria as a tool of like homemaking and a way of kind of transforming interior space. Um, and I want to talk about I think these memes are really funny to me, and and I think memes and humor are such an invaluable way of distilling information. Um, I, I, I love these memes because they kind of corroborate something about my argument that I think the pride of Puerto Ricans about their identity and their ties to the island often manifests through ornamentation and decoration and clothing. I mean, the, both the memes have the same kind of thesis, like, how did you know I was Puerto Rican? And I was like, okay, you have 10 flags on your house and you have a shirt and a hat and you're wrapped in a flag. So like, it's pretty obvious as a kind of visual marker what your identity is and kind of, you know, how you ride for the island in a way. Um, and obviously memes are kind of a bit exaggerated, but I think that they're true in essence. And, and that's why we find them so funny because like there's a bit of truth to them. Um, so yeah, I think thinking, thinking back um, to my cousin's house and all these souvenirs, um, I was really thinking about how like just beyond flags, like these souvenirs are really like receipts of travel. <laughs> like proof of connection to the island that is alive and kind of continues into the future. Um, you know, I think we have to kind of talk a little bit about like Puerto Rican migration to the US um, because the Puerto Rican diaspora is huge. I mean, if you know anything about the history, it's like 
think there's like 5 million Puerto Ricans living in the US and there's 3 million living on the island. So there's actually more people who identify as Puerto Rican that live outside of Puerto Rico than live inside of Puerto Rico, um, which I think that kind of asymmetrical um, population kind of lends itself to a lot of really interesting cultural manifestations. And this is really a culture and nation that is like defined by diaspora and movement. Um, you know, it has a long migratory relationship to the US. And I think over time that migration is increasing cyclical because we have American citizenship and because of colonialism, um, fraud as that may be. Uh, so many Puerto Ricans are coming, they're going, they're kind of like going back to the island, they're going on vacation, they're visiting family. I was there two months ago, you know, I brought little things back. Um, and yeah, even like my own kind of personal history, like I, I grew up in Puerto Rico and then I moved to Massachusetts and then Pennsylvania. And, you know, it's like I have family in these little Puerto Rican enclaves all over the US. Um, yeah, so I think these objects are really evidence of like a larger migratory pattern and, and interplay. Um, so I think talk, and now we're kind of getting to like the kind of central part of the talk in a way. Um, because I think within the constellation of decorative objects that I'm calling Polqueria, there's one particular knickknack that I'm really obsessed with and, and, it, and it's kind of like the, the main icon of this project. And that's um, these tablillas, these vanity license plates. Um, and they kind of take a little bit of explaining to like figure out what they are because it's a little bit inside baseball. Like if you're Puerto Rican, you've seen them a million times. And if you're not, you just haven't. Um, but there are these like, Vanity license plates are made of tin, um, and a lot of Puerto Ricans kind of own them and mount them as a way to proclaim where on the island they're from. Um, they commemorate like hometown pride. Um, I think like Puerto Ricans love being, you know, love like riding for the island. But like on a more specific level, like when two Puerto Rican people kind of talk to each other, it's always like, okay, where on the island are you from? Um, and I and you know, hometown pride is like such a way of life. So these kind of tablillas localize people and their family to like a specific place. Um, like this is like another graphic that I think explains it more clearly. Like, are you from Bayamón? Are you from Yauco, from San Dulce? Like, you know, they, they, these uh, license plates, the word in the middle kind of corresponds to a specific town in Puerto Rico. Um, and yeah, like if I, you know, I think like I have two of them myself. Um, these are my tablillas and, you know, there's one in my car from Ponce where I grew up with my mom and my brothers. Um, and then um, I spent a lot of summers um, in a little hill town south of San Juan with my grandma. It's called Naranjito. So I have another plate that says Naranjito on it. Um, and they're just kind of a way for me to like keep these places close to my to my physical space, but also like keep them fresh in my memory and like yeah, just it's a it's a kind of a tender ornament and and it brings back a lot of memories. So um, you know, it's really about hometown iconography. And I think um, these two photos are also, uh, the left I took myself and the right I found online, but um, the on the left is a, a photo I took of my roommate's laptop. And like, you know, e even if I hadn't known them, like as soon as I saw the laptop, like I knew where they were from in Puerto Rico because that's how kind of powerful the icon of the WI is. Like, I know they're from Arecibo. And then this picture on the right, I think is really funny because this guy's like fully covered in flags. They're coming out of, I don't even know where they're coming out of. They're just like everywhere on his body. Um, but he's very clearly from Caguas. Like I'm a thousand percent sure that he's Puerto Rican and I'm a hundred percent sure that he's from Caguas because like, why else would you have these things hanging um, from your body that just say Caguas on it? Um, so yeah, I think, um, you know, I, with, with Dabli, as I mentioned earlier, I've kind of seen them countless times growing up and I, never really paid much attention to them. Um, but I think the fact that th their form is in the form of a license plate um, is really fascinating and kind of worth considering um, more deeply because I think license plates um, are, they're interesting. They have a very particular logic and, and set of like poetic relations, like in their normative iteration, like as state generated documents, um, they're really about like sanctioning and restricting movement, um, license plates, I mean. Um, like you, you know, your car needs a license plate or like, or you can't really drive it around the block um, because I guess like pedestrians and then officials can't know who you are if you're like driving with no license plates. Like police can't run your plates and stop you if like, for example, you have a warrant or something. So um, license plates in my eyes have a really deep colonial and punitive logic and they're really about surveillance and access. 
um, who gets to move, who doesn't get to move. Um, where I think like the Puerto Rican tablillas, the vanity plates are kind of like an alternative registry, like one that's fugitive, one that's not governed or generated by the state or really anyone. They're like, I don't know, you can just get them online. You can get them in stores. It's really like not about the, the state in a way at all. Um, so I think what really interested me at first about them was that they kind of subvert this logic of registration. Um, they kind of replace that with like a different logic of movement um, and one that kind of I think fits the lived reality of like Puerto Rican migration and the diaspora um, in a way that isn't like about the state. Um, I think another funny thing about um, Tablillas is that for an object that repurposes such a bureaucratic and record keeping form, there's virtually nothing written about them um, in any academic journals or in any articles. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about record keeping and archiving later, but I just always found that to be really funny how like they're, you know, reusing this logic of registration, but they're not found anywhere outside of like when you encounter them in real life. Um, so I guess from here, I want to go back to like the tablilla that started it all, um, that really started this project and really got me thinking about these ornaments a little different. And that's um, this mural. Um, by an artist from Chicago named David Flores. Um, it's, it's in Massachusetts. It's in a city called Holyoke, which is where I grew up. Um, I've walked by it a million times. Um, and I walked by it a million times without thinking twice about it. It just, you know, it was just like part of the landscape for me. Um, but if you're thinking about what I was talking about earlier and like how Tablillas have like the name of a Puerto Rican town in them, you'll notice that this one um, doesn't have the name of a Puerto Rican town. It has the name of a town in Massachusetts in New England in the US. Um, and, you know, looking at this, I just always was like, is it saying that Holyoke is part of Puerto Rico? Like, is that what it's saying? Um, and it is, that's actually exactly what it's asserting. Um, this is not a tin tablilla, this is a painted mural. It's in four panels. It sits um, right next to the city hall that like, clock tower building here is like Holyoke City Hall. Um, and um, yeah, it's this kind of large painted tablilla, I think reframes Holyoke as like interior to the island of Puerto Rico, um, as much a municipality of Massachusetts as it is a municipality of Puerto Rico, um, an exclave uh, of the island that's not on the island at all, actually. Um, you know, Flores' mural follows a tradition of like tablillas annexing spaces in the US and claiming them for the island. For example, like, uh, oh, actually, um, before that, I just wanna like talk a little bit about Holyoke really quickly, just cause I think it's important like texture to like this idea of reframing the city as part of Puerto Rico. Um, Holyoke is like a small town in Western Massachusetts. It's like a former mill town. Um, but if you see on, on the right, um, if you're looking at communities with the highest percentage of Puerto Ricans, communities in the US, Holyoke is number one, like one out of every two people in Holyoke identifies as Puerto Rican. So it's a really kind of weird little town where like almost everyone speaks Spanish and like, you know, you have kind of like all these really fun um, like colors and, and, and murals all over the city that I think like Puerto Ricanize that space. Like this is this is actually Roberto Clemente, who was a famous Puerto Rican baseball player, but who played for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Um, and it's it's on the side of like a domino club, which is um, pretty famous and and well well attended. And then on the left, you just have like the facade of these of the storefront of these buildings that have been like muralized in order to like, you know, put a Puerto Rican flag on it or like put Taino symbology and stuff. Um, so. And then here we have like, I've always found these to be really funny, but um, the, the, these buildings are also in Holyoke. And um, unlike any other building in Holyoke, they have these bars on the window. And if you've ever been to like the Caribbean, you'll you'll notice that like, this is a very particular vernacular aesthetic choice. Like this house in Ponce, for example, has like all its windows barred. Um, and it's just like a thing that um, happens in Puerto Rico and in the Caribbean a lot. Um, so I just always found it kind of funny that these, that, that in, uh, intervention was like also placed um, on these uh, like post-industrial buildings. Um, 
And, you know, the Puerto Rican history in Holyoke is like goes back a long time. Like it, this is a picture from 1973. You can see the kind of iconic clock tower and people marching down Dwight Street um, manifesting for like Puerto Rican rights. Um, and and this is a kind of at the nascency of the of the migration. So they were really trying to establish like political power and organizing when they really had a lot less than they do now. Um, so yeah, back to the mural, um, because I I. I think it's just super interesting that this, along with um, these, are in the structure of the tablilla, but what's written on them is not places from the U.S., but actually places, I mean, not places from Puerto Rico, but actually places from the U.S. So you'll see like the Bronx, Brooklyn, Holyoke, these are all um, places in, in the U.S. that have had really large concentrations um, of Puerto Rican people and, and of migration from the island. Um, and I guess like my thesis when it comes to these um, license plates is that they kind of redraw the contours of Puerto Rico in a way. They kind of suggest that maybe the island is growing into the U.S. They're creating new lived realities at odds with common sense. Like, can someone be in Puerto Rico and in Massachusetts? Um, you know, growing up in Holyoke, I think that sometimes it felt that way. Um, and a lot of times it didn't feel that way. It's kind of like a weird inter space. Um, and yeah, I think in the case of Flores's mural, um, he kind of aptly registers like a satellite town of Puerto Rico in the United States through this mural work that he's done. Um, and yeah, I kind of like um, showed you like the spatial interventions present in Holyoke, but I'm gonna kind of dial it back and put on my art historian hat um, for a second because in the history of like the Puerto Rican diaspora, um, tablillas are not the first and only object that I think appropriate US soil for the island. Um, these are like uh, casitas, um, they're in New York City. Um, you know, they, they kind of came up um, in the 1970s when um, the Bronx was experiencing an epidemic of fires where a bunch of buildings um, were kind of being burned to the ground and like housing stock and these really Puerto Rican and Black neighborhoods were quickly disappearing because of a lot of things. The building codes weren't right, landlords wanted insurance money. It was like, it was a really kind of dark time for the borough. Um, and uh, a lot of like per Puerto Ricans who were really familiar with like vernacular architecture from the island ended up um, building these little houses. Um, and on the left, you'll see like a, a photo from artist Perla de Leon of this casita that kind of hovers over the rubble of this burnt building. Um, and these were kind of like, I mean, this was like an example of like resistance from the community. I mean, you have all these fires that are burning all these spaces and um, these little houses came up as a, as a way to give space to the community to like organize, to like party, to chill. Um, and on the left, I mean, on the right, you also have a, a casita that still exists today. Um, it's called Rincon Criollo, it's in the Bronx. And um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's it's just really funny to see these like little slices of, of Puerto Rican architecture like in the middle of New York City. Um, and I think like, you know, unlike Tablillas, like um, there's a lot of art historical research and, and papers written about um, casitas. They, you know, it was on my syllabus when I was in a class at, at, in my undergrad. So, um, you know, they're they're talked about. They're they people know what they are. Um, but I always what, what I found interesting about them was that in the rhetoric um, from these art historians and from people who participated in the building and use of of these little houses. Um, is like a rhetoric of teleportation. One of the kind of famous essays about Casitas is titled, I'm in my country. Um, so I think imbricated within the imagination and the materiality of Casitas is the idea that you can gain passage between the discrete worlds of Puerto Rico and the Bronx by entering them. Um, they exist here and there, but not entirely in, in either place. And I argue that Casitas occupy a place apart, um, a habitual site of worlding, an ontological shoal, a threshold of sorts. Um, I think to cross into a casita is to like be in some suspended place between like the Bronx and Hayuya or like Brooklyn and Orocovis. Um, I think in a casita, like space and time kind of collapse because you're like in this little house, like that is kind of like Puerto Rico, but you're like in the Bronx somehow. Um, 
and it, it does these really interesting things with like the semiotics of space you're like you're in both places at the same time is the way I see it at least um and is kind of my argument in the essay um and I I I, I think the kind of architectural aspect of of um my point here is going to be drawn out a little bit later but um I kind of see the tablillas and the polqueria and the windows and the casitas as kind of being this like coextensive network of like spatial intervention um, of like making the U.S. feel more like Puerto Rico somehow in some kind of abstract and poetically gestured way. Um, you know, I think Gasita still exists as a reminder of like the resistance and resilience of a lot of Puerto Ricans in New York City. But I think um, the tablillas and the polqueria and the decoration is a uh, brings Puerto Rico into the U.S. in a much more piecemeal way. Um, I think it kind of indicates like the premium of public space like I, I would find it I think it'd be really hard to believe if someone just built a house in the middle of like Manhattan or the Bronx these days because like the red tape and the bureaucracy and the building codes really won't allow for that kind of intervention anymore that that era where you could just build a house on top of rubble is like kind of gone um, but you can still you know no one's going to tell you you can't decorate your house with like a million different things so um, I think Polqueria has always been a way to like discreetly and privately intervene on the domestic space, kind of redefining and further atomizing um, the Puerto Rican interior, if you will. Um, and yeah, I think like in a kind of poetic way, like my cousin's house is both in Boston and in Puerto Rico. Like my room in like Pittsburgh is like occupies both places to me. Um, and yeah, this is kind of the part of the talk where I'm going to transition into my work, the kind of like things I've done uh, engaging with these ideas and with these objects, um, because I have kind of engaged with them in the past. And I think actually doing this presentation and writing these, uh, this essay kind of reinvigorated some ideas in some ways. It's really, really, Harrison and I were talking a little bit before everyone joined just about how it's really nice to kind of go over old ideas and um, I don't know, like refill them with life somehow. So um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, these prints that I made. Um, as I said, this as an as a written project, this um, started through the Guggenheim workshop that I participated in, and um, part of the part of the work was making a kind of written piece, but then part of it was also making an object, like making an art piece. Um, and I decided that I wanted to print make and um, my own my own tablillas. Um, I think for a few different reasons. Well, first I'll just kind of guide you through the pictures, but on the bottom left, you'll see like my little at home printmaking station. Um, and then on the uh, top left, you'll see like the prints I made. And then you see me like gluing one of the prints to my wall in my apartment. Um, I think I really wanted to highlight the, the through printmaking, I really wanted to highlight the documentary capacity of tablillas. I think the way that they evidence and corroborate you know, a phenomenon. Um, I think printmaking using ink and paper, the black and the white, um, was a way for me to like treat tablillas like a contract, like a document, like a, I don't know, like that that concreteness that like documents have in our lives. Um, and I also think that the kind of laborious and often meditative nature of printmaking was a way to kind of counteract the mass production of of tin tablillas, which are usually like anonymously made in factories. Like it's, you know, no one's hand making these license plates. They're like mass produced. Um, so I wanted this project to have, kind of have like an element of tenderness and familiarity, um, which is also why I did all the printmaking at home. It was also kind of COVID still. So like, I mean, it still is COVID, but it was like worse. Um, and it was just a lot easier to like do it at home because um, I could do it on my own. And I didn't really need access to like a studio or, or a shared space. Um, but yeah, I think um, the part of the project that kind of interested me and one through line that, um, again, thinking about architecture and ornament that I think I'm noticing now that I've had some time is just the way that I sealed it onto my wall. I think that was, you know, without knowing it, that was a kind of way for me to like link these two kind of modes of thinking about these license plates, both as like an ornamental feature and as an architectural feature, which I think are both important to my practice, um, like sealing it into my house as opposed to like having it be something you can just easily take on and off was a kind of resistance to like 
the just ornamental quality of these license plates. Um, you know, joining it to a house, like combining it with the actual wall in some way. Um, and then um, this is kind of like a same print, but different piece. Um, you know, I was like, I wanted to submit the piece to a show, but um, it was glued to the wall of my house. So I really couldn't submit that particular piece. And I was just kind of trying to be creative and wondered how I could translate this very intentionally domestic project into like the gallery space. Um, and the answer was like these chunks of drywall that I was working with, because I was like, at one point I was trying to make a boat using drywall. It didn't really work, but what ended up happening was that I had all these chunks of drywall um, just like lying around. So um, I figured like, you know, I don't know, there's something about these chunks of drywall, like a material that usually kind of coats the inside of the house and like uh, gluing it and then kind of extracting it in, in a way I can carry this piece and I can show it um, because it, like I said, it's a very intentionally domestic project and you know, no one's really gonna come to my house to like see this. Um, sorry, I think I broke up a little bit, but anyway. Um, yeah, so I, this is kind of also the part of the talk. These are just the pieces that I've done, but um, where I kind of am looking forward to like the way that this essay and this project is gonna influence later works. Um, so I'll take, talk a little bit about like new takeaways and like future projects and um, the way that the digital realm has like kind of come into this in an unexpected but kind of fruitful way. Um, first, I, I have this like emerging photography project. I kind of hesitate to call it that because I'm not a photographer and also none of the pictures are really any good, but it's they're, they're pictures. It's like a thing that I'm doing. Um, in the years and months since this project started, I've paid a lot more attention to like Puerto Rican ornamentation whenever I see it and I encounter it like in the wild, in the world. Um, and I'm like often just snapping a quick photo on my phone of these like instances where like I encounter like what was in the memes, for example, where like someone just has flags everywhere. Um, you know, because like I said, there's really nothing written about tablillas and there's really not a lot written about this this uh, this thing that I'm advancing about Polqueria. So I kind of found myself taking these pictures as a way to like amass a body of evidence. Like what I'm talking about is like real and like I'm not crazy and I'm not just like making this up. Um, so here we have like a smattering of photos. I mean, like these are like, this is a car I saw in Pittsburgh. And then below that is a car I saw in Boston. And um, inside the gray square is like my next door neighbor's house in Springfield, Massachusetts. And then the kind of like picture with the red circles. The reason I have that gray thing is because I just didn't want to like have take a picture of someone's house like creepily and then put it on a presentation without their permission. So I like kind of eliminated as much like um, identifying information as possible. But I was taking a, a walk one night around um, around Pittsburgh, around my house where I live, and like I saw like this example of like exactly what I'm talking about, like this big Puerto Rican flag on the window and this like little one in the car. Um, and yeah, I guess like I'm just growing this little archive of like encounters. Um, there, are, I have more pictures on my laptop and on my phone, but because I'm not at home right now, they're kind of hard to access. But I think you guys kind of get what I'm talking about. Um, I don't really know what to do with these photos. I guess like I'll just hold on to them and they can be like a kind of personal archive. But it is kind of an interesting through line that I wasn't expecting to kind of have emerged through this. Um, and then another really fun aspect about specifically like having written the essay through Bunker um, is that before when I was like writing the essay and it hadn't been published, I would Google like Puerto Rican WS all the time to like find pictures online and stuff and like nothing would come up. But now if you Google Puerto Rican WS, the very first thing that comes up is the essay, um, both on images and on like the regular search. So um, yeah, just thinking about like the way that I'm kind of leaving a kind of paper trail, or I guess an online trail, it's not paper at all, um, of, of this phenomenon is like really exciting to me. I think both for like future, like anyone in the future who's interested in this topic, but also like as a way of kind of making my mark on this scholarship, because, you know, it was something that was really hard to write about because no one else has written about it. Um, and then I think lastly, um, this photo 
I think really interested me. It's like, if you notice, it's like the photo that kind of emblematizes the essay. It's the one that Harrison kind of chose as like the, the main photo of the essay. Um, and it got me really thinking because, you know, this, this is a photo that I got from a website where you can just customize your tablillas. Like you can just go on there and write in a little te text box and then pay $15 and then they'll send you a tablilla with whatever you wrote on it um, written. And I was like, I kind of want to do that. I want to like, I want to make, I want to buy my own customized tablillas, but I'm like, what do I put on it? And I decided that, um, that I was going to like make a kind of half poetry, half visual kind of project where like I'm filling these tablillas with like, I guess like poetic musings or like evocative phrases that I think further abstract the meaning of home through these license plates and like what it means to inhabit Puerto Rico. So I have like a digital rendering. I know it's a lot, um, but just like words or phrases that I think, I don't know, that I think like in a weird way should be put on a tablilla somehow. Um, you know, my initial engagement with these license plates is was very material, um, like the prints I made or even just like buying physical ones um, that I can like put in my house in my car. But I kind of like moving forward, I kind of want to maybe engage with them in a more immaterial or like more conceptual, more like sensual way. Um, so these are like a digital rendering, like I haven't actually got these made yet, um, but I think I will and I want to like put them together and kind of have a bunch of them that I can like, I don't know, they're modular, so I can kind of move them around with these phrases. This is not in any particular order. Um, some of it is in Spanish, some of it is in English. Um, I won't translate um, because, you know, that kind of ruins the purpose for me. But yeah, I I guess I'll end, I'll end the presentation here. But um, yeah, just thinking about what spaces are in Puerto Rico. And I think like a smell can, like sometimes a smell reminds me of home. And like, I don't know, that's like to me a really, a really powerful thing to put on one of these. Or like el caldero is like the pot. So like anything in the, like when I'm cooking, like whatever's happening in that pot, baby, that's Puerto Rico. That's like, there's, you know, that there's, that's another world in there. That's not, we're no longer wherever I am. Um, so yeah, I kind of want to, that's like a project that I'm kind of, that's germinating. Um, yeah, Ugh, I've been talking for like so long, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna end it here. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, I, any questions, any kind of conversations that you want to have, I'm, I'm really here for. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Armani. That was incredible and very exciting to see, um, where you've gone since, uh, we began working on that that essay together, or rather we began revising it together. Um, yeah. And so while, you know, everyone who's um, here with us today, maybe while you sit with some of that, I have some questions um, that I can get us started with, get the conversation going with, um, or maybe comments, I guess. This first one is, is a little bit of both, but I'm really interested now returning to the piece and thinking about the way that you're, I mean, you, you talk a lot about it in the piece and you've mentioned this in the talk as well, in that, a lot of this, um, a lot of this kind of world making takes the form of appropriation. Um, you know, using the uh, I'm worried Armani's frozen. Give me one sec. I'm gonna send him a message. Yeah. Oh. There you are. Oh, I'm here. Yeah. Can you just repeat that from the beginning? I, I kind of, I broke up a little bit. Yeah, no, no, no worries. Um, so what I, what I'm, uh, was, I'm interested in hearing how you think about, um, the way that a lot of this world building takes the form of appropriation of the kind of dominant colonial jargon or, you know, systems, it, you, you know, you talk about the bureaucracy of, um, license plates, but also the claiming of space and the annexing of space are both also very colonial activities. Um, and you talk about them being kind of decolonial or anti-colonial, and you use the word subversion. Um, and so I'm interested in, in if you've thought at all about kind of like the where the line can be drawn between 
um, effective subversion, creating like authentic anti-colonial space, um, and when that action becomes dangerous, when that appropriation potentially reproduces the violences. Not that I'm asserting that, but you know, I think just you know the, yeah. the audio lord, the master's tools, and how how all yeah that yeah yeah relates to to what you're doing here, what you're interested in. What an easy question to answer, huh? What a what a no. I yeah. think I think it's a good, I think it's a really good question. It is a good question. Um, you know, I think like with respect to like uh, the mural in Holyoke, for example, like um, actually like there was a big controversy about that mural because the kind of white property owner where it was go was like this can't go here. Um, uh it's it doesn't represent Holyoke but it actually really does I mean if one out of every two people in the city are Puerto Rican then like um then it is true you know in essence for a lot of the people who live there um so I think like you know it, it's it's it is trying to do this work of annexing space but I think where it kind of stops short of like that um that danger and that violence is that it's really symbolic like it's really about recognizing a truth and not about kind of projecting um or pre or determining a kind of control you know like i i holyoke actually just uh um you know puerto ricans have been in holyoke for like 70 years and we've only just gotten political representation there like the, the first puerto rican mayor was elected last year um after 60 years of organizing um and a lot of like really hardcore organizing um so you know, it's, it's, it, I think, um, yeah, it, it, I think it is doing, I think it is doing a little bit of that, of that like subverting, um, but it, it, you know, we don't really have the kind of power in the U.S. to like, say like, you know, we, we, Holyoke can't just become part of the, of the Puerto Rican union or like become part of the nation. It's like, that is like probably never going to happen, even if there's a hundred percent of people in Holyoke that are Puerto Rican. I think like, uh, so it's always like this striving for, and and a lot of it is like, um, a lot of it is like restorative. A lot of it is like, you know, so much damage has been done, and so much political suppression has been done. So these kind of gestures of like re-annexing is are they're always um, they're always kind of fighting back. You know, like they were never the first stone throne if you will it's always like a defense mechanism to all these pressures um but I think it's a good question I think it's something that I'll think a little bit more about because it's it is really hard like on a kind of linguistic level um when you're talking about annexing and appropriating like you're right it, it is these kind of gestures that have roots in these kind of colonialist behaviors um but it's it's yeah it's just I don't know I I see it as a more defensive tool um but yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's a great answer. I really um I don't know. I think I think emphasizing the fact that it is a semiotic or symbolic rep recognition of something that is already a true, a true thing and not an assertion of a or trying to define a new kind of order. Um right. That's a really important distinction that I think you, you know, you you acknowledge implicitly, at least in the in the work, in the piece. Um, and I guess somewhat related to that and this is maybe act an, an actual softball but um uh or maybe not i don't know i think you, you could you could go different ways with it but um i while you were talking i was looking at the etymology of souvenir which is i think souvenir the word in french i don't speak any french but according to google it means a memory and its origins obviously a souvenir is to remember and mm. um so thinking about that distance that I mean, you know, these objects, specifically souvenirs, I guess they're they're um, they're symbolic or semiotic in the way that they're pointing, obviously, towards a thing that is not present, but also towards the uh, present physically, but also present in the present, and that kind of temporal distinction um, that's embodied in within the idea of a souvenir itself. Um, and so, I'm curious if how you've been thinking about time and memory in, in yeah. both looking at these historical, you know, the the casitas, which are now less common, um, but also thinking about that maybe more abstractly. Yeah, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about memory um, and time. I think um, 
Yeah, I only just kind of noticed like like the other day, I the souvenir aspect of the presentation is very new. I didn't write about it in in the terms that I, I spoke about them today because it kind of only just dawned on me. But uh, I just I find it super fascinating that like like my cousin, for example, feels the need to have so many souvenirs from Puerto Rico as if she wasn't born there and raised there. But I think it is really about. creating this space that's habitable and and about making those kind of memories like I don't know easier to access in a way like like um you know the I'm pretty sure she goes to Puerto Rico all the time so and and she has to if she's gonna have a million souvenirs in her kitchen but I think each time in a kind of symbolic way it's like it's like she takes a little bit of like soil like it's not real soil it's a little glass but like it's like she takes a little piece with her and you know over the course of her you know entire life she's like over 40 it's 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 a lot of pieces and in a way it kind of like it 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 starts kind of a, the the accretion of like um of stuff is a way for her to kind of feel like even if she's in this like cramped apartment in boston like she has the stuff that she needs to feel at home um and it definitely is about about time and memory because you know a lot of us like like a lot of my family I have a lot of family in Puerto Rico still but I have actually a lot more family that doesn't live on the island and that maybe goes once and once every few years so it's really this like this I don't know gesture of like reciprocity and I think in the in the in the presentation I called it like a receipt because I think that's another thing that I think it really is it's like it's like proof it's like this idea that you know, home, capital H, is really far away. But like, look, I go all the time. Like, I'm constantly there. I, I always bring something back and I bring gifts for people and I do this. So it's like, it's like this corroboration. I don't know if it's like some psychological tool just to make someone feel like they're still a part of the place. Because I know, I know like a lot of, you know, like I struggled for a long time because when I left Puerto Rico, I think it was like 10 years before I went back. Um, not for any particular reason, but just because like, you know, I was young when I left and it costs money to go and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a hard place sometimes. Um, so I think like these souvenirs really are about keeping that memory fresh and keeping that kind of connection fresh. Mm -hmm. um, I guess related to the souvenirs, I'm also, you mentioned briefly, um, that you identify a lot of these objects as being kind of kitsch. And I mean, there's obviously a lot of maximalism in the memes you showed us and the images of the people kind of wearing the Puerto Rican flags. And I think that also is maybe a little bit of you finding the extremes to demonstrate. But as you said, I think there's a little bit of truth in all of the memes. And so I was wondering what, um, how you thought about kitsch, the idea of kitsch in relationship to um, that kind of accretion that you're talking about. And, and then also, um, yeah, I guess that's not not unrelated to these ideas of maximalism. Yeah, I mean, you know, I studied art history. I read I read Clement Greenberg's Avant Garde and Kitsch. Like it, you know, it was part of like the the major. It was part of the major. You had to, um, and I think it's an important term because I I think, it, you know, it escapes me. It's been years, but I think one of the kind of aspects of that essay is like, Kitsch is 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 kind of the tool of the masses in a way it's like it came about with this idea of mass production and of like consumerism um so I think like in a way that is kind of like one of the only ways that we can consume Puerto Rico if you want to if you want to call it that or you can you know you can consume any I, I mean I'm, I'm in Italy right now and like you walk two feet and there's like knickknacks everywhere um Florence this you know Bologna that you have you name it and I think like it's it's in a kind of like cynical way, it's it's like a it's like a way to like I get like I said consume this this site like prove that you've been there, um, but, but I I you know I think like when when a someone when a tourist buys like a souvenir or or is like engaging in these kind of this kitsch aesthetic uh, of of these foreign places, um, it's like for a particular reason and like when someone like my cousin does it, it's like um, I don't know it's like it's the only way like you can't if you can't live there like how else can you consume the place you're from and it often in this kind of consumerist culture like it just manifests through these through this aesthetic through this like maximalism through 
like these tiny little objects that litter that litter at home. Um, so yeah, I, I have been. I, 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 in a kind of previous draft of the essay, I kind of more plainly uh, referenced that essay, but I just wasn't really sure because it's so dense. I wasn't really sure how to like include it without it being a distraction. But it definitely the essay and the kind of like pitch as a kind of aesthetic position is something that I think undergirds the the work in a way. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I I, I want to think more about it, but it's it's there. I think your question is like right on. Um, I just want to make make space for anyone else in the call who'd like to or has thoughts that maybe they want to run by Armani. Um, if you do, feel free to unmute yourself and and ask directly, or you can write something in the chat. Um, and if not, you know we can keep going. I've got I've got a lot. Uh, well, I'm interested. This is a less less uh, processed thought, but um, especially in thinking about your your kind of nascent photography project where you're like clocking and documenting um, like even little instances of Puerto Rican flags or Puerto Rican identity displayed publicly. Um, and then also thinking about the casitas and like them being specifically, um, their resilience was not only in the their little construction in the rubble of this kind of like violent racial um, burning economic also violent, economically violent, but also their construction of community from these spaces that were originally highly privatized. Um, and so thinking about how uh, this accumulation of things can both happen within the home. I mean, a lot of your work is focusing specifically within the home using, you know, little h and then big H within the little h. Um, but then thinking about that being outside and like the differences between um, internal space and external space, community and individual identity and all of all those things. So, you know, not, not super resolved, but excited to hear what, yeah. how you're thinking about that. Yeah. It just makes me happy to see it. I don't know how to explain it, but um, you know, it's, it's like, I think SJ who's in the chat when we were waiting for the bus one time in Pittsburgh and they were just like, look, and I looked and it was like, it was the, the flag in the car. And that's when I took the picture. Um, so it, it, it kind of gets me excited to see these things out in the world and out in the wild, not only because they corroborate my very academic and kind of stupid arguments, like not stupid, but you know what I mean? Like, I know that this is a really kind of trying to make something very basic highbrow. I, I'm really aware of that sometimes, but um, yeah, I think that um, they, it just makes me happy to see, which is why I kind of, I think that's why I started taking the pictures too, because it's like this encounter, um, makes me feel less alone like when I like the the photo of um the, the one where I grayed out with the with the house in the car that's like down the block from my house and I had been saying um when I'm since I moved to Pittsburgh like oh there's not too many Caribbean people like there's not too many like you know like they don't really play Puerto Rican music at the club like that and this and that and you know you kind of like start to talk your I mean I did I'll be honest like I'm like oh like there's not you know where are my people um, and then seeing that it's like, oh, they're here and like, and, and, you know, if they hadn't been kitschy or, or brave enough to just put the flag on the window, like I would just, I would have never known. Um, so yeah, it's like these encounters are like really invigorating to me and, um, and yeah, it, it, it makes me feel more at home. Um, big H and little H. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, if, if Jordan, you want to ask a question, please go ahead. Yeah, I do. Thanks, Armani. This is great. It's lovely to hear you talk um, and just have following your practice for a bit. I've been thinking about the idea from Jose Esteban Munoz of strategic obliquity, which is like this public yet private, if you know, you know, um, aesthetic of work. Um, and I was just wondering, like, what is your position on how how detailed and how much explanation you want to give to your practice and like, who's your audience? And um, do you care? Like, as you were saying, you're not going to translate because that defeats the purpose of if it's like in Spanish. So like, what's your positionality, especially like in an artist market where like, it's all about the explanation. Um, where do you draw the line? And like mm. this, I'm not going to explain this, but like the group who knows, like knows this. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And it's a question that I think has haunted this entire project from the very beginning, because I, I, I find myself having to do a lot of explaining. And 
I think part of it is good practice because you know, as a writer, sometimes you write, you don't really know what you want to say, you write so that you figure out what you want to say. And I think the same is true for art. Like, I don't never really know what's going to happen, but I'm, I'm clearly trying to say something. But I think the explanatory aspect is something that I, it, it, it's a rub. It's like, it, I, I chafe with that because, because you're right. It, it's, it's, you know, if, if I had just come here and I only showed you like the last two slides and I tried to kind of walk you through this history it would just would not have been it, it, it's it's illegible to probably everyone I, actually there's a lot of friends on this chat these, these are all people I know um so I think most of you would have kind of picked it up because I've, I'm talking I've been talking about this incessantly for years but to someone who doesn't know my practice or doesn't isn't aware of like the kind of how dense the iconography of these objects are it's opaque it really is opaque and I I, I mention glissant and productive and opacity in in the essay because and it, you know relating to the way you were saying about Munoz um because it's it's a it's you know the the opacity is both productive and limiting like it both uh illuminates some part of his like some part of my personal history and my community history that like um I'm really interested in but it also you know I have to, I find myself having to like, I'm like in a machete through the jungle trying to explain to people who don't know this, like what this is. Um, but I, the more I do this, the more I'm like, you know, if I have to explain a little bit just for you to get it, that's fine. I think, um, I think that's where the kind of future project is. I, I'm kind of leaning more into the opacity because I'm not, I'm, I'm, you know, in the project where I'm like, putting the, a smell in the tablilla, you know, that's kind of for me. Like, that's just kind of like something I want to do because I am recognizing the value in that and the kind of poetry in that. Um, and I'm hoping that eventually like that translates, but I'm, I'm, I think I spent a lot of, a, a lot of this project has been explanatory and I think I'm ready to let that go. And I think this kind of talk is really the, the, you know, like I'm getting over that, like the the top of the roller coaster, as it were. Like I did so much explaining, and now I'm ready to just free fall and kind of get weird with it, because um, I don't really want to explain too much. I think, um, I think it has a role, and I think you're right in this kind of art market in this art world. Like it's it's there's that you're never you're never not going to be in a position where you have to explain really. But I, as much as I can, I'm. I'm backing away. I, I wrote the essay. It's on Google. The search engine optimization is hitting. If you Google Puerto Rican Tablilla, it comes up. You can read it. You cannot. But from now on, like my work is just gonna just gonna take on the form that it does. Uh, with respect to these tablillas, obviously, it's you know, the entire time I've kind of just been talking about this tablilla project. But yeah, no, I think that's a really good question and 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 one that. Yeah, one that's really like been there the whole time that I, I haven't really known what to do with until now. All right, if anyone else has um, thoughts or questions, uh, would love to hear them. Um, but if not, I feel like that's also a pretty, pretty good place to end. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, thank you so much, everyone who's joined us. Uh, and thank you, of course, Armani, both for the original essay, all of your work with Bunker thus far, and the incredible uh, talk you just gave us. We're very excited to, to see what's next, or at least I am. I think I'm speaking for everyone, though. Um, yeah. And I should also, I would like to do a quick shout out um, to SJ in the audience, who will be our next handoff contributor. So everyone, um, keep an eye out for that. That will be coming uh, very soon in the new year, sometime in January. All right, and with that, I will say thank you again. Yes, very and, excited. Um, we'll uh, hope you all enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thanks for coming, everyone. Bye. Cheese. <laughs>